59. Uh, for you that are at home, if you got a book, and we're, we're, we're not using books here. All, right, all you folks at home, stand up. Everybody stand up. We're ready to sing. Amen. Wipe the sleep out of your eyes. Put that bowl of cereal down. Uh, I see you out there. Daddy, get out of that bed. Uh, it's time for church. Mama, get, get dressed. Uh, Carrie sent me a text this morning and said she couldn't figure out what to wear. Amen. All right. We're going to sing Lean on the Everlasting Arms. Ready? Everybody sing it. Let's all stand. Sing it out. What a fellowship. What a joy divine. Lean on the everlasting arms. What a blessedness. What a peace is mine. Lean on the everlasting heart Leaning I'm glad we can I'm glad we can lean on Jesus From all along Leaning 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 on the everlasting heart Good Alright, I want to hear y'all Everybody ready? Oh, how sweet to walk in this pilgrim way, leaning on the everlasting arm. Oh, how bright the path grows from day to day, leaning on the everlasting arm. Leaning, leaning, safe and secure from all alarm. Leaning, leaning, leaning on the everlasting on the last number three ready what have i to dread what have i to fear leaning on the everlasting arm i have blessed me with my lord so dear leaning on the everlasting arm leaning leaning Safe and secure from all along. Leaning, leaning, leaning on the everlasting arm. Thank you. You can be seated. Good morning. It is a real joy to be able to come to church. I'm so thankful. The doors are open here at Shining Light Baptist Church this morning. And uh, we're glad all of you are here. Those that are in the back, those that are in the junior church, uh, uh, all y'all that are watching at home, we just uh, welcome you to the service today. And uh, we'll try to make this as much like you being here as we possibly can. It's a, a, a dark, dark time in our history. Uh, we are seeing what we've never seen before in this country. So uh, this morning, we're going to go to the Lord in prayer. We're going to uh, make some, uh, a couple, I'll mention a couple things. We're going to pray and we'll have our regular Sunday school hour. Uh, we'll take a break about 1050 uh, and then start the preaching service just a little bit early, a little before 11. So don't go nowhere. Uh, Y'all stay with us for the whole service day. We've got some surprises. We've got some uh, things you're going to enjoy. And, uh, and we'll talk about next Sunday. Next Sunday will be our drive-in uh, service for Easter Sunday. We went visiting yesterday, and uh, everybody we talked to said, I can't wait till Easter Sunday. I want to come to church. I want to come to church. And um, or they're watching this morning. We had some really, really good visits yesterday. And uh, if you can go to the store, you can visit. And we we uh, we had some real good talks with people. We sat out on the front porch and talked in the yard and had prayer with people. And you don't know how much they appreciated it. Uh, so uh, I'd like to encourage you, find someone who's older, who can't get out, don't get to go nowhere, and visit them this week. Uh, just face-to-face -face talk, have prayer with them. The Lord will bless you for it. Now, um, we had a special request for a young lady who is in serious condition, needs a heart, and only in her 40s. And Brother Ed mentioned it to me a minute ago. I want to be praying for her today. Let's also pray for our country, for our our, our, our leaders, that they'll make the right decisions during this time. Um, there's, um, there's something more going on here than just a virus hitting people. Uh, something far more sinister. Uh, that, something stinks. 
somewhere. Something stinks, folks, somewhere. The, and I don't know how much is God, how much is the devil, how much is politics, how much is fake, how much is real. All I know is the Lord's right, the Bible's true, and the same God that's brought us through everything else will take us through this. I guarantee you that. We'll come out on the other side. And uh, I'm sure Brother Derek will have words to say to us this morning uh, in just a minute. But uh, we'll, uh, we'll, uh, we don't know what hard times is here in this country. Uh, we may be fixing to find out, but uh, we don't know what hard times is. Well, I'll talk more about that in the preaching service. But let's do pray that the Lord will have mercy. His will will be done. And all of you at home, if you've got something or somebody, you that are here, uh, you want us to pray for, just raise your hand right now. All right, let's pray. Yes, mm -hmm. yes, uh, they had a suicide in their family. Let's pray for them, the Cook family. Yes, sure did, I'm sorry. We need to mention them, remember the Cook family in prayer this morning. All right, let's pray. All right, Heavenly Father, we sure do thank you for the opportunity to come to church this morning. I'm so thankful that we're here. I'm thank you, I thank you, Lord, that the doors are open at Shining Light Baptist Church this morning. Thank you for all those that are, that are listening by uh, means of the airways. Uh, those at home, those that are traveling, those that are in other states and in other countries that are with us today. I pray that you'd bless every single person that watches and hears this program or this service today by, uh, this, by the time it winds up on the radio or wherever it winds up. I pray, God, that you'd bless all of our folks here this morning. Those that are here this morning, I pray that you'd bless every single one. I pray that you bless those that we visited yesterday and talked with and prayed with. I pray for that lady in the hospital, for all the people that are sick in this country uh, this morning, Lord. I pray that you bless them. I pray that you'd work in our hearts and in our lives. Do what ought to be done as we uh, prepare ourselves for the, the preaching service and then tonight and then the big service for next Sunday morning. Have you way in our hearts this morning. I pray for these special needs. You saw the hands that were lifted. You know the need of every single heart. Now, Lord, do what ought to be done here today. Take our hearts and mold them and make them what you want them to be. Bless the special singing we got coming up in a little bit. And, Lord, I pray especially for those out there this morning that long in their heart to be back at church that you'll work it out they can be back soon and we'll thank you and give you the glory for what you do in Jesus name we pray and for his sake amen amen all right brother Derek's coming with our lesson this morning everybody get ready at home get your bibles out uh uh not your phones your bibles so you can follow and we'll go back and forth in the scripture Amen. All right. Well, it is good to be here this morning. I'm, um, God's still good. He's still on the throne. He's uh, still been good to us, and uh, we don't have a right to do anything but praise Him this morning. Amen. So, uh, with that in mind, we're going to go ahead. Thank you. We're going to go ahead and get right on into the lesson. Now, uh, I will admit this is a little different talking to a basically empty room. Uh, I know a lot of people are watching. Um, uh, the few that are here, I need y'all to amen extra loud and laugh at my jokes extra loud, okay? Because there's not many people here today. So uh, it don't matter if they're funny or not, just make me feel good, all right? Uh, no, I'm kidding. But um, I want to just say a couple of things and we'll get right into the lesson. First of all, this, um, like Brother Danny just said, this is unlike anything we've ever had to face in this country before. Um I'm, I'm 50 years old. We got a couple in here younger than me, some older, and uh, I think y'all could say the same thing, that this is this is different. This is something that's going to take some getting used to. I hope we don't have to get used to it very long, but we don't know. But one thing it's done is it's panicked the entire country just about. Um, one thing I'll say that um, a situation or a crisis like this uh, pandemic has caused, it will sometimes bring out the best in people. And when I say that, it... People will sometimes bind together and they'll help those who can't help themselves. They'll maybe go out and do a favor for an elderly neighbor or something like that. So something like this, a trial can bring out the best in people. It can also bring out the worst in people. It can make people very greedy and selfish and only thinking of themselves. And, and they'll go and buy all the toilet paper and they don't care if you need any or not. And they're going to buy more than what they're going to need in six months. I mean, you, you all know what, what's going on there. People, they panic. They get crazy. They don't think. They don't settle down. They don't just be calm. They, uh, they panic and, and do all kinds of crazy stuff. And it also brings out the stupid in people. Um, 
there's been some people do some really stupid things lately. Uh, and I will, I will give you an example. There was a, a young man in a Walmart in Missouri, I believe it was, that uh, got arrested, went to jail, as he should have been. I hope he's still in jail. Uh, and he was going down the aisle saying, I'm not afraid of the coronavirus. And he was licking the items going down the aisle. Now, you can't fix some levels of stupid. So let me, let me just say something about that. Coronavirus or not, why was it ever a good idea to lick items in Walmart? You, you forget the virus a minute. If, if somebody had just stocked that item or if a customer had just handled it, they might have just gone to the bathroom and didn't wash their hands. They might just pick their nose. Why would you ever lick items in Walmart? Does that make any sense? So it brings out the stupid in people. There was another guy, he was going around filming himself, telling everybody, I've got the coronavirus, and he really didn't. And he was getting up near people and all that stuff. Listen, I don't condone violence, but if somebody decked that guy and knocked him out on the floor, I'd look the other way. I sure would. I mean, you say, well, you shouldn't say, well, I'm telling you, there, there's no sense in stuff like that. So let's take our Bibles this morning. We're going to talk just a little bit about what we need to do as Christians. And I'm going to go to a passage of Scripture that's very, very familiar to every one of us. It's in 2 Chronicles chapter 7. You already know where I'm going. Um, I, was, I had a couple of things in mind this morning I wanted to talk about. This was one of the verses I was uh, kind of throwing around a little bit and thinking about. And I'll be honest with you, I, I went this direction because I believe it's the right direction and also because of... Uh, a Facebook post that I read this morning from a friend of mine in California who uh, wrote an article on this verse, and um, I'm going to be sharing that later, uh, but uh, brought out some very, very good points. And uh, I'm going to uh, go to Second Chronicles tra chapter 7 this morning, and we're going to talk about what the Bible says that the people of God need to do when the hand of God is on a nation or when a, a trial or a tribulation comes on a nation. Um so let's start with verse 13 this morning. The Bible says in 2 Chronicles chapter 7, verse 13. Did I even, did I turn the other mic on? Yeah, no, I didn't. Okay, here, let, yeah, let me get the cordless on here. 2 Chronicles chapter 7, verse 13 says, If I shut up heaven that there be no rain, or if I command the locusts to devour the land, or if I send pestilence among my people, if my people, which are called by my name, shall humble themselves and pray, and seek my face, and turn from their wicked ways, then will I hear from heaven, and will forgive their sin, and will heal their land. Let's talk about this a little bit this morning. Let's just go through this verse and see what it is we can do as, as children of God. You know, when I don't claim to possess the vast knowledge of the rest of my Facebook friends. I have seen posts from... Uh, I think I saw last night, I have 460 some friends uh, on Facebook. Some of them I've never even met, to be honest with you. Some of them are good friends. Some are people I don't see anymore, but went to school with. It's, it's, a, it's a variety of things. Some are family. Um, but I've seen that all of my Facebook friends seem to possess a great amount of medical knowledge that I don't have. The problem is they're all over the place. I have seen, you need to do this. No, you need to do this. If you do the other, that will kill you. But no, if you don't do that, that will kill you. Then I have seen posts like, this is all a big hoax. This is fake, which is not true, okay? Then I've seen posts where they say, well, they're going to try to use this to take away our rights. I believe that is true. Uh, they're, they're trying to capitalize on this to further an agenda. That's definitely true. Anybody disagree with that? Okay, okay. Um, but that don't mean there's not something going on. There is. I, I also agree with what our pastor just said. There's something a lot more going on that's very sinister. I have no doubt about that. In fact, my wife and I were um, out driving yesterday because that's about the only thing you can do anymore uh, is get out and drive somewhere. So we were driving, just took a drive, didn't come in contact with anybody else. And the end times thing, I've, I've preached on the end times for years and Bible prophecy, the rapture, the antichrist. But my, my philosophy on that is... I'm going to say changing. My doctrine's not changing. I still believe the way I did, but I'm starting to see things, I think, a little more clearly than what I ever did before. And we were talking yesterday as we were driving about the Antichrist. And in the past, we've all preached. Preachers have preached for years. There's going to be a man of sin that's going to come along, and he's going to demand loyalty. You're going to have to take the mark if you buy or sell, or you're going to lose your head. That, that's true. That's all coming. But please don't misunderstand what I'm going to say here. 
I've often questioned, well, when that happens, why don't people just say, okay, that's what the Bible said. I better not take the mark. But it's not that easy, and I'm going to tell you why. Because when the Antichrist comes on the scene, he's going to make sense. Listen to what I'm about to say here. This thing of staying home, not spreading this thing around, everybody stay home. You've got people on one side saying, they're trying to strip us of our rights. We're Americans. We can come and go as we want to. I get your point. I really do. On the other hand, if this thing is real and it's spreading, and it's going to kill thousands of people, staying at home is a smart thing to do. It makes sense from a logical standpoint, don't it? It makes sense to say, okay, we have a crisis here. People are going to die. We got to quit thinking about ourselves and pull together and we need to stay home. That makes perfect sense logically. When the Antichrist comes, I used to think it was going to be, he's just going to rise up and say, okay, we're going to do it my way. If you don't like it, we're going to cut your head off. What's going to happen is there's going to be a major crisis, the rapture, people are going to disappear, and, and everything's going to fall apart, and the Antichrist is going to come on the scene, and he's going to pull people together, and he's going to have a solution that makes sense. That's why people are going to follow him. They're not just going to look at the Bible. Some may, but uh, the world, the Bible says the world wanders after the beast. They're not just going to look at the Bible and say, oh, no, right here it is. Oh, we can't do that. Here's a man that's going to make perfect sense. He's going to be logical. He's going to be compassionate. He's going to have the answer that everybody says that's the only way we can do this. That's why people are going to follow it. And there's going to be a, a real catastrophe. It's not going to be fake. The rapture is going to happen, folks. This thing's not fake. I don't believe that for a minute. I believe people are getting sick. I believe people are dying but they're going to take a crisis of this nature and use it and capitalize on it. It's an opportunity to further an agenda. That's what I'm saying. So that's what I want you to be aware of. What they're telling us to do makes sense. The thing is, we also see the other side of it. What the Bible says that Christians are going to lose their rights and we say, we got to stand up and do something. But I just want to throw that in there. But let's, go, let's get back into the scripture this morning. Verse 13. I want you to notice... Three times in this verse, the Lord personalizes this by, says, I, by saying, I. If I shut up heaven, that there be no rain. Yeah. Or if I command the locusts to devour. If I send pestilence. Let me just tell you something right now. If you're one of these that says, oh, God would never do that, you need to read this verse. He says himself, if I send pestilence among my people. Now, I'm not going to stand up here and say if this is the judgment of God on America. I have my opinion. Uh, but I, I, you hear people are all over the place about that too. Somebody says, oh, this is definitely the judgment of God. Then people mock that. Let me just tell you how our thinking has been messed up. I had several conversations with an atheist this way, or with several atheists actually online, and that's what you do when you're off work and you got too much time on your hands. You get in discussions and debates on Facebook. And uh, some of them were mocking God and they were saying, well, if this is really the judgment of God, they were taking two, two positions on that. One would say, well, if that's the case, then why are Christians getting it? Well, I'm going to talk about that. So this thing's not discriminating on whether you're a Christian or not. Christians are getting it. And, and people like me, well, if God's so, if he's so against me, why don't I have it? We'll, we'll deal with that in a minute. Then the second thing is, well, if this is God, then who would want to worship a God that would do that? Now, I want to hit, hit on that one. Because you know what's under the underlying mindset of that argument is? God owes me something. I'm special. I can just mock God's existence and shake my uh, fist in his face and cuss him and, and mock his followers and I can go out and fornicate and, and live in perversion. And I can lie and steal. And how dare God judge me for that? Who's God to tell me I can't do that? See, that's the attitude. That's the attitude they have. So, well, who would want to worship a God that would do that? Why do you think you deserve any less than the judgment of God if you spend your life mocking Him? If you spend your life denying His existence, if you spend your life mocking His people and living in the way He's told you not to live, why do you think you deserve anything but judgment? He's been merciful to us far too long if you want to know the truth. We've been preaching for years God's going to judge this country, hadn't we? And now that it's finally here, oh, well, why would God do that? Because He's sick of our sin. He's sick of our sin, that's why. Verse 14, here's what to do about it. If my people, which are called by my name, shall humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then, I will, hear, then will I hear from heaven and will forgive their sin and will heal their land. I'm going to say some things this morning. I, I will probably, the, just the handful that's in here, I will probably make everybody mad at some point. I have a way of doing that anyway. I'm, that's not my goal. But I'm just going to tell you something. 
Verse 13, the Lord takes responsibility and says, hey, I might send a drought. I might send the locusts to devour your crops. I might send a pestilence or a plague among you. But here's what to do about it. Let's start, let's just break it down here. If my people which are called by my name, now contextually, let me, before anybody says I'm taking this out of context, this was a covenant promise to the nation of Israel. It was not given to the church. There was no church, okay? So I want you to know that I understand that. I also believe there is a principle of application here that does apply to the church. If my people, which are called by my name, we today are the people of God, the church. We are called Christians. Okay, in the Old Testament, that was Israel. And in a covenantal sense, Israel still is the people of God. If you look at Romans chapter 11, God, the Bible says God hath not cast off his people, his people, which he foreknew. Now, that doesn't mean the Jew individually has to get saved. He has to come to faith in Christ. But as a nation, that is still God's covenantal chosen people. And that's who this is written to in 2 Chronicles chapter 7. I understand that. There's also a, a broader principle. If you look at Proverbs 14, 34, the Bible says sin is a reproach to any people. Or I'm sorry, righteousness exalteth the nation. Sin is a reproach to any people. They talk, that's talking to us too. Amen. That can be applied to us. Sin's a reproach to any people, the United States of America included. Righteousness exalts a nation. Sin will bring it down. The Bible says the wicked shall be turned into hell and the nation that forgets God. So there is a broader principle that we can apply this verse to us today. Okay, and that's what I'm going to do. Here's what we need to do in a time like this. The Bible says, if my people which are called by my name, let me just say something about that. I'm about tired of Christians, myself included, I've done this. Well, them people in Hollywood need to repent. No, we people at Shining Light need to repent. Amen. Okay, it's not Hollywood's job to do what we ought to be doing. Amen. You know, we say, well, them poly up there in Congress and the Senate and the House, they need to repent. Yeah, they do. So does the churches in Burke County right. and Caldwell County, McDowell County, Catawba County. The churches around here, the churches across this nation that claim to be churches that believe in the Bible, we need to repent. If my people, he didn't say if the people out there call on my name. He says if my people, the ones who profess to know me will call on my name. That's where it starts. That's here, folks. Amen. I'm going to say more about that here in just a moment. If my people, which are called by my name, shall humble themselves and pray. I've seen a thousand Facebook posts lately. We all need to pray, and we do. I'm not, I'm not, not making fun if you posted that. We do need to pray. Tell you what we need to do before we pray is humble ourselves. That's what's missing in a lot of our prayers is, is humility. There's not much will humble you any more than knowing that you can go to the grocery store and something you can't see can put you in the grave by this time next week. That'll humble you. We're as big as we thought. We're not, we're not as invincible as we thought. See, we've come and gone in this country for so long, we just expect it. But I'm going to tell you something. You got something now. You may catch it, and I pray you don't. I hope nobody does. But you may catch it today, and you may be in the hospital by Wednesday. We don't know. We don't know. That'll humble you. That'll make you realize that God holds my breath in the palm of his hand. He can take it any time he wants. He can grant me another one. And if he does, I'll use it to praise him. And if he don't, I'll praise him on the way up. I'm going to tell you something, folks. We need to get to the point where we get humble before God and realize we're nothing. This thing could take us out. None of us knows what, what it's going to be a month from now. Look how much has changed in the last few weeks. Yeah. We've had to do church differently uh, uh, the last three weeks than we've ever had to do it before. Two weeks ago, uh, we had about 50 people here. That was the law. Then now it's only supposed to be 10. Um, and, and we didn't even have Sunday school two weeks ago. I think we had two services where we, some came to the early and some came to the later. Then we had Sunday school last week. We don't know what it's going to be next week. We don't. I think we need to get humble, folks. We need to realize that God's in control. He always has been. And he's showing us now that he truly is. Um. Let me read on. There's another verse I want to bring into this, but uh, I think we need to be humble. In fact, I'll go ahead and bring the verse in now. Luke chapter 18, Jesus described two men that went to pray. Let me turn over there. I don't want to mess this up. Um, I want to get it right. Luke chapter 18. Look at verse number 11. The Bible says, The Pharisee stood and prayed thus with himself, because the Lord wasn't really listening. He says, God... I thank thee that I'm not as other men are, extortioners, unjust, adulterers, or even as this publican. Two men there. One's a, a, a Pharisee, the other's a publican. 
And he's looking at that public and saying, God, I, I thank you that I'm not like this. Look at him. What a sorry individual. Well, he needs you, Lord. And that's what this guy says. He says he prayed with himself. I fast twice in the week. Aren't you wonderful? I give tithes of all that I possess, and I make sure everybody knows it too. And the publican, the other guy, standing afar off, he was social distancing, would not lift up so much as his eyes unto heaven. He didn't say, Lord, I claim your wonderful... No, you know what he said? He wouldn't even lift up his eyes to heaven, but smote upon his breast saying, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. What did Jesus say about that? I tell you, this man went down to his house justified rather than the other. For everyone that exalted himself shall be abased, and he that humbleth himself shall be exalted. You know what Jesus said? As two men went up to pray, one thought that the Lord kind of owed him something because he was special and he did everything he was supposed to do. So surely God was pleased with him, but his heart was black and wicked and cold, and God wasn't even listening to him. Yeah, here comes a man that says, Lord, I, I'm such a failure. I'm a sinner. God, I'm wicked. This flesh just gets the best of me. God, will you please give me mercy? And the Bible says that's the man that went down justified. Back to 2 Chronicles chapter 7, humble ourselves. Let's stop thinking God owes us and let's realize that we're behind on what we owe him. Amen. We're behind on the praise that he's worthy of. We're behind on the witnessing that we're supposed to be doing for him. We're behind on our giving. We're behind on a lot of things. We're behind in the life we live from Monday uh, through uh, Sunday. Uh, just out, We're supposed to be reflecting the light of Jesus Christ to this world. We're behind on that, folks. Amen? Amen. All right. Humble ourselves and pray. Now we pray. You know what we do? We pray after we get humble. Because you, let me say something. You can pray and not be humble. In fact, you can pray without humbling yourself, but you cannot humble yourself and not pray. When you get humble before God, you're going to want to pray. One thing about this um, virus thing, it's taken away a lot of our idols, hasn't it? You think about it. You say, well, well what do you mean idols? We don't, we don't have a statue. See, that was Israel's sin for the most part. You look in the Old Testament, Israel was constantly falling into idolatry, false worship, worshiping images. I doubt any of us have an image in our home we bow down to. I hope you don't. But... Boy, sports is a god in this country, isn't it? Not anymore. Not now. Now, I miss it. I'll be honest with you. This is the first time since I've been alive that I ain't been able to watch basketball in the month of March. And I miss March Madness. It bothers me to know the NC State will be playing for a national championship very soon. There you go. Amen. Um, some of y'all slow didn't catch that. And some of y'all are probably laughing at me at home. Um, baseball season will be starting. I kind of miss watching the Braves. I really do. But you know what? None of that really matters. Look how insignificant that is right now. Hold what against me? Who do you like? I don't watch. Oh, okay. All right. I watch fishing. You watch fishing, okay? I guess I guess you can still fish, can't you? You ain't really hurt anybody out there on the lake. But, uh, but you think about it though: baseball, football, basketball. Well, football season's over anyway. All the things people thought were so important. Guess what? We don't even have it now. The Lord's took it from us. Right. Yeah, I'll tell you what you can do to fill in that gap. Pray more. Get more serious with God. Get in, get in the Word like you had. Been. This is a very good time to read the Bible more and pray more. It sure is. You, you'll fill in that time that you'd be wasting watching sports and get right with God. Get humble before God and pray. That's what we're supposed to do if, if pestilence is sent among, uh, among our nation. And pray and seek my face. Those two kind of go together, but I think seeking the face of God is a, a little bit deeper aspect of prayer. You can pray just like you can pray and not humble yourself. You can pray and not seek God's face. But you can't seek God's face without praying. If there's ever a time, church, we need to be seeking the face of God, it's right now. Amen. Right now. Things are getting bad. Things are probably going to get a lot worse. Let me, um, let me go ahead and uh, give you another verse of Scripture here. And I'm going to make some points on that. I'm going to park on this for a while. 1 Peter chapter 4 and verse 17. Well, actually, before you turn there, let's read the next one. And seek my face. And here's where we always like to stop. All over Facebook, we need to pray and seek God to remove this virus from this country. There's one more thing we don't need to leave out. Turn from their wicked ways. Again, he's not talking about Hollywood. He's talking about my people. Turn from their wicked ways. Now, Hold your finger there. Let's go to 1 Peter chapter 4, uh, yeah, chapter 4, verse 17. 
I'm going to read a verse that just sends a shiver through me every time I read it because it's, it's a fearful verse. The um, Bible says this. It says, for the time has come that judgment must begin in Hollywood. Is that? Oh, let me read it again. I'm sorry. For the time has come that judgment must begin in Washington. In my eyesight. Raleigh? Oh, they must, Charlotte, down there with that big city, wickedness down there. Or San Francisco, right? Is that what it says? Y'all help me. I must be reading it wrong. Must begin, oh, okay, I got it now, at the house of God. Amen. That's where judgment must begin, at the house of God. We're always pointing fingers out there at the world saying, well, this world's wicked. Judgment must begin at the house of God because we're supposed to know better than the stuff we're doing. And if it first began at us, listen to this. Oh, this is fearful here. And if it first begin at us, what shall the end be of them that obey not the gospel of God? And if the righteous, oh man, listen to this. If the righteous scarcely be saved. So before we get this big idea that we're something because we're saved and, and Lord, I realize who I am in you. I'll tell you who you are in him. You are a sinner that by the grace of God would be in hell or on your way to hell. That's who you are. And I, these big television preachers don't really preach it that way, do they? We need to realize our position in him. Um, your position is, by, except by the grace of God, you'd be lost. That's your position, okay? If the righteous scarcely be saved, where shall this ungodly and the sinner appear? That'll make you realize something. If you're saved this morning, it's only by the good grace of God and his mercy that you are. He don't owe us anything, folks. Every blessing he's ever given you, he did not owe you. And now all of a sudden, some of his blessings might be uh, going or, or leaving. We might have some hard times. Where think, Where's God at? He's the same place he's always been, on the throne. But it's time we get humble and pray and seek him and turn from our wicked ways. Let's talk about that for just a little bit, can I? Yes, I told you this was going to be a scorcher. Here it comes, all right? I'm not even going to sit here and ask, should I say this? Yeah, I should. Yeah. All right. You want to get rid of this thing? Let's get serious and let's get right. I know there's a lot of people watching. I'm probably not even preaching to the, the, to the few that are in here. I'm probably, maybe I am, but I'm probably not. But there's a lot of people watching. So, and there's a lot of people going to be watching this. So uh, you want to know what to do when there's a pestilence on the land? You want God to hear from heaven and remove this? Let me tell you how we're not going to do it. Okay? If I make you mad here, I'm sorry. We're not going to do like I saw Kenneth Copeland doing this morning and commanding the coronavirus to leave America and crawl on its belly out of here. Okay, I saw that this morning. That's not how we're going to do it. We're not going to do it like Jesse Duplantis tried to do it and says, I bind the coronavirus in Jesus' name. You will never infect another person. That was two weeks ago he did that and it's still infecting. Amen. Something didn't work, buddy. Okay, I'll tell you how we're going to do it. Maybe if we start doing what this verse says and get serious and quit our sinning, God might do something. I don't read anywhere where it says, if my people shall bind the virus and tell it to leave them alone and then keep doing what they're doing. I don't read that in that verse, do you? Well, people's got some weird theology. And, and we wonder why the world who sees these guys all over uh, the internet, they sit back and say, boy, them Christians are nuts. Some of us are. Let's get back to the Bible. What's the Bible say we need to do? Turn from our wicked ways. Amen. We've preached this in Bible preaching churches for years. If you're sinning, Turn from it and repent of it and get right with God and whatever it is. And we just sit there and we think that we're so special and God understands our circumstance. Well, the Lord, he knows and, and I'm not perfect. I ain't talking about being perfect. I'm talking about quit walking in willful sin. What am I talking about? Maybe you profess to be a Christian. But you're not above telling a little lie once in a while. And you call it a little white lie. Lies don't have colors. Amen. Amen. What's a white lie? Exactly. We're supposed to be honest people as Christians. If you're a liar, quit lying. It's about time we turn from our wicked ways. You say, well, I pray. Good. That's only one of the things you're supposed to do. Humble yourself, pray, seek my face, and turn from your wicked ways. Christian young women. Oh, I love the Lord, but you're going to bed with your boyfriend. God said not to do that. And you act like nobody's going to tell me what to Okay. Okay, you're not humbling yourself. You're bowing yourself up against what God said. You're saying, I'm going to do what I want to do, like it or not. 
So we have no right to point a finger at God and we won't even quit our own sin and say, well, God, why are you doing this to us? He's told us, turn from our wicked ways. If you don't do it, don't, don't mouth off at God because of what's happening. Same thing with young Christian men. Well, I, I, I'm asking my girlfriend to do something for me. I, I, I'm not man enough to marry her yet, or we're going to get married, but we're not going to do what God said and wait. Uh, I'm, not, you know, I'm not ready to walk down the aisle, but I'm going to ask her to sacrifice her virtue to make me happy or, or you know, make her feel like she'll lose me. Really, she ought to lose you. You ain't worth having, amen? I'm going to tell you something right now. If you loved that girl, you say, well, I love her. If you loved her, you'd want her to be right with God. About times people say some stuff. We need to turn from our wicked ways. I'm tired of Christian people taking unbiblical stances on social issues. I'm a pro-choice Christian, yeah. You're a pro-choice Christian. So as a Christian, the Bible says God hates the shedding of innocent blood, but you say, well, I believe it's a woman's decision to do what she wants with her own body. It ain't her body. You're about 75 years behind on your science. It's not her body. I believe a woman should be able to do what she wants with her body. If you want to paint your hair blue and look ridiculous, have at it. I don't care what you eat for lunch or where you go or, or what. I don't, I don't care. You can do whatever you want with your body, but you don't kill anybody else's body and say it was my decision. You, if you want to talk about choice, you should have made the right choice to start with and not conceive a baby you don't want to take care of. Turn from our wicked ways. How can Christians say, I'm a Christian, and then turn around? I don't mean to get political, but I cannot help but put this in right here. How can Christians say, that I love the Lord, I believe the Bible, and then you will turn around and you will go and vote for somebody that believes abortion should be legal and that believes that it's okay to fund Planned Parenthood and that believes in perversion of, of the institution of marriage and say, I'm going to go vote for them because our president isn't nice. He's not sweet. He's, he's too blunt and, and he's hateful. Yeah, I, I agree. I, I wish he was nicer. I wish he hadn't done a lot of things in his past that he's done. I really wish he hadn't said what he said on that tape 15 years ago. That's not the same as killing a baby, folks. That's not the same as saying two men ought to be able to get married and we're going to fight for your right to do that. If you think those are on the same thing, I don't know how to help you. I wish we had a righteous man of God leading this country. I do. But let me just tell you something else you might not want to hear. God can lead a man who's not even a Christian in the right path. God can use that man to accomplish his will also. And I'll tell you something. Give me a president, if he's not going to be a Bible-believing Christian, at least give me a president that will say, I'm going to protect the rights of Christians. I'm going to stand with Christians' right to worship. We're not going to limit that in this country. And we're going to stand for the life of the unborn. But he's not nice. You're a nut. It, it, honest to goodness, I don't know how to help you if you think like that. I, I don't know how to help you. The Bible says we better turn from our wicked ways. And let, by the way, let me be clear about something. My hope and faith is not in the president this morning because I, I wouldn't want to be him right now. I believe it's taking a toll on him. I really do. I believe he feels a tremendous burden that he didn't ask for. And I think, well, he should have done it. He should have done it. Let me tell you something. I would not want to be the president right now because no matter what he does, he's going to get it from somebody. Um, I'm going to say this. If your hatred for him is so strong that you cannot realize and admit that by him putting that travel ban in effect when he did save millions of lives and this thing would be a lot worse, you can't be reasoned with because he did the right thing on that. And his opponent says, I wouldn't have done that. And then just this week flipped course and said, oh yeah, that was the right thing to do. Okay, well, let's vote him in then. He didn't have a clue what he would do. I, I don't, let me get it away from politics. I did not mean to go there this morning. Um, I won't be charging any extra for that, though. Turn from their wicked ways. Folks, you want to see an end to this thing? Let the church get right with God. Examine our own hearts. What we ought to do today, I'll tell you one thing that we have done. My wife and I have read more of the Bible together. Uh, we, we stopped yesterday. We rode up on the Blue Ridge Parkway yesterday. What else can you do? Okay, at least there you can keep your distance from everybody. And we, we pulled up, uh, we took two camping chairs with us. And we pulled up at an overlook and just sat out there in the grass and read our Bible. I think we read eight, nine chapters. And, and had prayer. Folks, we need to be examining our hearts. Let me hit on a few more sins that we might need. Can I do that? Would that be all right? Or did I hit it too hard before? Um, talked about you young ladies that call yourself a Christian. You're dating an unsaved guy and you're going to bed with him. They, they, you know, you might want to repent of that. It's wicked. You say, well, everybody does it. Christians aren't supposed to do it. Amen. I'm used to having amens. It's hard to preach to an empty bunch of chairs. I wish these chairs would say amen or something. Bible says if my people, you know, the rocks will cry. Somebody go get a rock or something. But let me just say this. 
God knows what you're doing when nobody else is watching. You know what character is? Character is not what you pretend to be around everybody else that you want to impress. Character is what you are when you are alone and it's just you and God. So, men out there watching, let me just ask you, are you a man of character when your wife's back's turned? Amen. We got a man of character back there. Are you watching garbage and filth on your phone, on the computer, on the television when you think she's going to bed or she's, or she's um, gone shopping or where? Well, I guess she's going shopping a lot now. But when, she's, when her back's turned, what kind of man are you? Are, and you call yourself a Christian. Let me ask you, are you saying no to the flesh and saying, I refuse to set a wicked thing before my eyes? Or are you just saying, oh, well, I have that desire? Listen, we all have flesh desires. That don't give you the right to give in to every one of them. Let me help you with something. That's where a lot of the homosexuals have missed it, and we missed it too. They say, well, God made me this way, or otherwise I wouldn't feel this. Let me tell you why we have wicked desires. We're sinners. We're fallen. You weren't created that way. We were created perfect. Man, by transgression and sin, fell. Now we have sinful fleshly desires we have to deal with, and we all have them. Thank God that's not one of mine. But you know what? Just because you might feel that desire does not mean that's how God made you to be. God didn't make you to be that any more than a man who murders was made to be a murderer. What happens is we are sinners by nature, and that sin nature takes over, and it manifests itself in many different ways in different people. But that's the root of all of it is we have a fallen nature that needs redemption through the blood of Christ. So let me tell you something. You call yourself a Christian, you've been saved, the Spirit of God dwells in you, you don't have to give in to that flesh desire. Your flesh may still desire something wicked, but you have a right to say no. I'm telling you, if we want to see God's touch on this country, we're going to have to do what this verse says to do, and we're going to have to turn from our wicked ways. It's not just praying. we got to turn from some things that we like. Amen? Amen then... Notice the word then. That's a big word, isn't it? Four letters, it's, but it's a big one. Then will I hear. What does he mean by then? When the conditions have been met. Okay? Then will I hear from heaven. Folks, I'm just going to be honest with you. If all we're going to do is pray, Lord, just put an end to this virus, bless this food in Jesus. Listen, if that's all you're doing, I'm not going to see an end anytime soon. And let me just ask you about this. Let's say they get this thing under control in a few weeks or a month or so, life's back to normal. What? It's going to be something else next. It'll be something else. You think uh, we get through this, the Lord can't bring something else to get our attention? This is a sample of what's to come, folks. This is just a little precursor to let us know that everything is not all right in America and there's going to be a time that America's going to have to answer to God. Now, I'm going to tell you something. Then will I hear from heaven. Once that condition's been met, I'll hear from heaven, I'll forgive their sin, and we'll heal their land. See, we, we expect all of that just for, for a simple little two-minute prayer, and we don't want to turn from anything. Oh, we're not going to make any changes, but Lord, would you please just not let anybody else get this? I don't want nobody to get it. I don't want anybody else to get it. I may have it tomorrow. I, I, that's possible. I mean, we don't need none of us know. But I'm going to tell you right now, folks, if, let me see how I want to say this. I don't want anybody to get it, but I have no right to just, Tell it to leave, or I have no right. What I need to do is do what this verse says, and then pray, God, if you'll have mercy, take this thing away. Amen? That's all we can do. I pray. I'll pray for anybody that gets it. I'll pray that you don't get it. But if the Lord's using this to bring people to repentance, I can't command it out of here. I can't do that. I, I can ask God to be merciful. Now, I want to deal with this thing. Well, why do some Christians get it? Because I got news for you. Some of us need to repent just as much as anybody out there in the world does. There's Christians today that profess Christianity, and we, we live in, in open, willful sin. So why do we expect that we're something special and we're going to get by with that when the Bible says my people are the ones who need to start the repentance? Why don't we see a nationwide revival? You can't even see a churchwide revival. Maybe if God's people started getting serious and doing what we're supposed to do, we might have a bigger influence on the world. Did you ever think of that? It's hard to witness to somebody when they see you at work and they hear you cussing. That's, it's real hard to go back to them the next day or when, they, when they're friends with you on Facebook and one day you're quoting a scripture. The next day you're cussing. The next day you've got a picture of a beer in your hand. The next day you're doing this and, and you're, you're out there on a beach somewhere half naked. But I love Jesus and they see that and they're saying they're no different than I am. Maybe we need to act like the Christians we claim to be. Did I lie? Was that, was that a scorcher or do I need to get harder? <laughs> I'll tell you, folks, it's not, it's not a joke. 
I'm going to say one more thing and I'm going to close. Something else I've been seeing a lot of, and I want to I address this. Because it's come to America and we're finally having to suffer a little bit, we think that must mean the rapture is imminent. Now, it may be. I hope it is. But let me just help our thinking a little bit here. I am fully 100% a believer that the rapture will happen before the tribulation. I do not believe the church is going to be here. I don't believe we're going through half of it. I don't believe we're going through any of it. Now, so don't think I'm waffling on that. I'm not. I'm going to make something clear right here. The tribulation is a period of time outlined in the Bible. That does not mean we're not going to have tribulation in our lives. That does not mean we're not going to have to go through some things. That means the period that the Bible outlines as the tribulation, we're not going to be here for. I believe that's scriptural, but that don't mean we're not going to have to go through anything. And here's the problem with our thinking. Now that it's come to America, we think that must mean that Jesus is getting ready to rapture. Listen, our brothers and sisters other countries have been suffering for years. They've been imprisoned, beheaded, starved to death, tortured for years, and the rapture hasn't come yet. And now all of a sudden, we, we say, well, we'll pray for them. Now all of a sudden, we're inconvenienced. Oh, well, surely this means it. Listen. I hope that the rapture happens before I step down off of here, but it might not, and we might have a while to wait, and we might have to go through some things, and we better buckle down and get right with God and say, Lord, whatever comes, we're going to hold on to you. We're going to hold your hand and trust you to lead us through this. Am I right or am I wrong? Don't think just because we're getting out of here before the tribulation, we're not going to have tribulation. We are. And we're starting to have some now. I mean, I'm just, I'm going to be honest with you. I'm sitting back and kind of me and my wife are talking. I've, I've been feeling sorry for myself because we have a couple of vacations planned this summer that are uncertain right now. And we just don't know if we're going to be able to go on our vacation. Now, I love, y'all know me. I love to travel. It kills me to not be able to go anywhere. It kills me. Um, but it ain't going to kill me. If you want to get literal, it's not going to kill me. I may, I may not be here when it comes time to go on my vacation. May, uh, this thing might get me. I don't know. I'm just saying. It puts things in perspective and you realize what's really important. The places I was going to go on vacation, I've already been about 50 times to both of them. And, well, actually, we're going to Gatlinburg next week and I've been there probably 500 times. If I don't get to go, you know what? I've still been more than most people ever get to, so I got nothing to complain about. But we were sitting there thinking, boy, you know, all that seems so important. Are we going to get to go to the beach? I love going to the beach. I love going to the mountains. But, folks, I'm going to let God use this to get me where he wants me to be. Because to be honest with you, I've been having to do some own, some self-evaluation. I'm closing. i got about a minute here. I've been having to do some self-evaluation. I've realized through all this that uh, life's uncertain, and there's some things in my life and my heart that are not what they ought to be. And uh, I have to work on that just as much as I'm asking you to work on it. It's a daily thing. I have to keep this old flesh beat down and crucified just like you do. But I'm going to tell you right now, I'm, I'm not going to let this go to waste either. I'm going to use this time to get right with God. If he blesses us and we're able to get back to our normal lives, thank God. And we better and we better thank God if he does that. We better be grateful. We better uh, say, Lord, you are good to us better than we deserve. Amen? Amen. But I'm going to tell you something. If he don't, we say, Lord, you know what's best. The most important thing is that people are saved, not that I get to go to the beach. If this thing gets people saved, gets people to turn to him, then... Lord can bring good out of it. Right. All right, my time's up. Let's pray. Father, we do come to you today, and I thank you, Lord, for, for being a good God, Lord. And, Lord, we realize that you created this universe. This is your creation. You have a right to judge it. You have a right to deal with it. You have a right to send something. You have a right to sit back and allow something. Lord, you've been better to us than we deserve. The Bible says in Psalm 103, Lord, that you've not rewarded us according to our iniquities. Lord, we thank you for that. Lord, if you had given us what we deserve, we'd be in hell. Lord, we thank you for your mercy. We thank you for your grace. God, I pray that there will be people that hear this message, Lord, as poorly as it was delivered, but that they will take it to heart and realize, Lord, there's things in their lives they need to repent of. Lord, you're calling us to repentance. Lord, if we're the church, the called out ones, Lord, that's what we need to be. We need to be separate. And I'm asking you, Lord, to purify us and cleanse us this morning. If there be any wicked way in us, Lord, show it to us, Lord, and help us today not to, to live another day with that not right with you. Lord, bless the service. Bless our pastor as he comes. In Jesus' name, amen.
a father and mother nurtured and raised my brothers and sisters and the memories we made our pastor to lead us this altar to pray stripes that can heal and a blood that can save i have him blessed we live in a country it's the greatest on earth our black stands for freedom and what it is worth she stands in a my shoulder to lean on when I am down. That rock where he leads me when I'm so overwhelmed. The place where he hides me under his wing. He's not just a song, but he's the reason I Lately I've been looking back Along these winding roads To the old familiar markers Of the mercies I have known Now, I know it may sound simple But it's more than I can explain You see, there's no other words to tell you Than to say God's been sleep each night so I've read my share of hard times by myself 
Play and I can see when we cried those bitter tears. Oh, but I felt his arms around me as I faced those darkest fears. Listen, I've had more gains than losses, and I've no more joy than hurt. Oh, and his grace fell all around me, a The best way I can say it is this, God's been good in my It's good to be in the house of the Lord this morning. Already had a great Sunday school class. We hope everybody's having a good day at home. Uh, everybody stand, and uh, we're going to sing number 151. If you have a book at home, we're not using books here, but we're glad for all of you that have come in. We've got people um, uh, coming to church today. Let's all stand and sing praise him, praise him. You, you know it, so just follow me, and we'll get started on the right verse, okay? Number 151, let's all sing real big, real loud. Praise the Lord always. Let everything that hath breath, praise the Lord. Amen. Ready, everybody. Praise Him, praise Him. Jesus, our blessed Redeemer. Hey. Highest archangel in <laughs> Praise him every joyful song. Hey! Jesus is all his children. It is. There is him all night long. Praise him, praise him. Tell of his excellent greatness. Praise him, praise him. Every joyful song. All right, that's our interview.
introduction. Right back on the other side of the page there is an old, more a country sounding song, the dearest friend I ever had. Let's do a couple of verses of it right quick. Number 150. Uh, everybody singing real big and real loud. He's the dearest friend I've ever had. Amen. <laughs> I want to hear you. I want to hear you folks at home, girls, sing. When I was dreaming, beat out in sin, I had no peace, no joy within. But Jesus came and made me glad. Such a dearest friend I ever had. Save my soul. Oh, bless His name. these are on. Got something real special for the kids. Uh, uh, coming here in just a second, all you folks at home, make sure your kids are in the room watching right now. Uh, we want to say good morning to everybody. We trust and hope that everybody's had a good week and the Lord is blessing you. Uh, if you're able to get out and come to church and able are able to watch, uh, he has blessed you and been good to you. So, this is the situation we find ourselves in. Uh, I, I still say something stinks to high heaven somewhere. Uh, we'll we'll right. say more about that maybe later. But um, it's good to be saved. It's good to know the Lord's in control, as Brother Derek mentioned in Sunday school. Now, a couple of announcements right quick. Um, we appreciate everybody. Uh, we went visiting yesterday. We talked to a lot of people. And, and everybody we talked to said we'll be watching tomorrow. So we're glad all you folks are with us. I hope all you that are that are feeling bad, uh, maybe uh, uh, burdens or problems, the Lord will bless you real good. Um, uh, appreciate Brother Steve. I know y'all are watching this morning. Came over yesterday and sanitized everything again, and the whole church has been wiped, uh, Clorox, germ-free. Thank you, Brother Steve. Thank y'all, folks, for the for the uh, the offerings that's come in. People are mailing in their their tithes and offering. Uh, one, one person said, uh, well, when do I stop giving to the church? And the answer to that is when the Lord stops giving to you. If the Lord ever stops, we'll stop. He ain't going to stop. And so as long as we're able, uh, we'll, we'll give and support God's work. The work's got to go on and is going on. Yeah. All of our work, our, I hope you heard our new radio broadcast this morning on 760 AM. We'll be on there on Sunday mornings at 830 for the next few months. Brother John, the folks over there at the radio station are donating that to help people. And uh, it's just a joy. It's just a joy to see what's going on. We've been real busy this week. Um, we even got a wedding. We are having a wedding here Friday, and you can't come. <laughs> uh, Dylan and, and uh, 
Lisa are going to go ahead and move the, change their wedding plans, get married this Friday right here in the church. So maybe we'll have that broadcast. What time is that thing going to be, in, y'all? Two o'clock? So if y'all want to see the wedding, it'll be on here at two o'clock. Never done one like this before. Uh, but it's just a joy to be able to have all of you watching uh, from wherever you're from. Uh, there's over, there's been over 5,000 people watch those two services, sermons I preached on the coronavirus. We have heard from literally all over the country, people from other states, other countries, and people are hungry and wanting to know what's going on. And uh, I can tell you what's going on, according to this book. And so we're, we're glad that you're with us this morning. All right, kids, um, when we have online church and you have to stay home, you don't, uh, you might feel left out just listening to all these old people. So we have for our kids at home this morning, story time. Our story time starts right now. And uh, Mr. and Miss Fletcher from the cobbler's shop over in the Netherlands uh, are here with us this morning. And this is just for the kids at home. So all you kids at home, here we go. All right, take it away. Hey, kids. Hey, we sure have been missing you guys here at Shining Light Baptist Church. Woo. We know because of this old nasty flu, a lot Woo. of you can't come and can't be here, but we sure do miss you. And we want to read you a story from the Bible here this morning. And then Lydia is going to give you a little bit of uh, her take on it, her interpretation. But it's, it's found in the Woo. book of Mark, chapter 5, verse 25. And it says, And a certain woman which had an issue of blood twelve years and had suffered many things of many physicians yeah. and had spent all that she had and was nothing bettered but rather grew worse when she had heard of Jesus. Yeah. Notice that. When she had heard of Jesus, she came in the press behind and touched his garment. For yeah. she said, If I may just touch his clothes, I shall be whole. Yeah. And straightway the fountain of her blood was dried up, and she felt in her body that she was healed of that plague. And Jesus, immediately knowing in himself that virtue had gone out of him, turned him about in the press and said, Who touched my clothes? And his disciples said unto him, Thou seest the multitude thronging thee, and sayest thou, Who touched me? And he looked round about to see her that had done this thing, but the woman, fearing and trembling, knowing what was done in her, came and fell down before Amen. him and told him all the truth. It's always good to tell the truth. Amen. And he said unto her, Daughter, thy faith hath made thee whole. Go in peace and be whole of thy plague. Lydia, that is a great story in God's Word. Yes, it is, Jedediah. Boys and girls, did you hear? Did you understand what Jedediah was telling you? Yeah. I mean, this woman was sick for 12 years. Some of y'all aren't even that old yet. <laughs> and she had been sick 12 years. Yeah. She had been to all the doctors. She had spent all even of her Luke money. Even Luke might have looked at her. Luke he, was yes, a doctor. Um, very possibly Luke did. Yeah. But she had spent everything. And she could not get well. She was no better. Oh. And she had been hearing about Jesus. And she had heard how he had made the blind man to see. Yeah. He had healed right. him of his sight, of his blindness. And she had heard about the lepers. Mm -hmm. You know, they had a skin disease. Mm -hmm. And he healed them. And she knew if she could just get to Jesus that he could heal her, that he could make her whole again. And so she knew where he was going to be. And she went there. And she was able, like the Bible said, she was able to touch his garment. And immediately she knew that she had been healed. And the Lord knew immediately that someone had touched him. It was a different kind of touch. Exactly, too. Jedediah, a different touch. So she knew this, and he did. And he turned to his disciples, and he said, Who touched me? And they kind of <laughs> laughed at him. Yeah, like, they did. you know, Lord, uh, people are bumping what do you into mean? us. There's a, cr there's a yeah. crowd here, there's people. Touching yeah. and no juggling six feet, all over. No social distancing. Either. Yeah, none of that whatsoever. <clears throat> and he said, 
He knew that someone had touched him because the virtue had gone out of his body. And that meant his healing power. And so the woman heard them talking and she's like, I've got to tell them it was me. And so she said, Jesus, it was me. And you know what he said? He said, daughter. You know, earlier she was called a woman. Right. Yeah. But now she's called yeah. daughter. Exactly. Welcome to the family. Yes, <laughs> because she had had faith. She believed in him. And he told her, he said, thy faith has made thee whole. Absolutely. Jedediah, can you tell the kids real quick, we've got to wrap this up, what faith is? Yes, faith. You know, just a quick verse. Faith in the Bible in Hebrew says, is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. So faith is believing in what you can't see. That's right. And and this Bible tells us that faith cometh by hearing and hearing by the word of God. That's why it's important to go to church when you can, watch it online when you can, but read your Bible because you can come to Jesus by faith. And even during all this no nasty virus that's going on, everything's going to be okay if you've got faith. In Jesus, if you'll come to him and ask him to forgive you of your sins and to come into your heart and be your Lord and Savior by faith and believe it from your heart, Jesus will save you and you'll be a daughter or a son of the Lord Jesus Christ. And you can do that right there at home. You don't have to be here in church. okay? so until next time, Jedediah and I will work on getting another story together for you. Just know that we love you. We're praying for you. You pray for us. You take care. God bless. I'll have candy for you when you get back. (laughs) Amen. All right. Thank you very much. I appreciate that. Good story from the Word of God this morning. Now, uh, we're going to go ahead and um, uh, receive our offering this morning. So you uh, guys get the offering plates for us today. And those are in the back. I will be able to give to. It's an honor to be able to give. Uh, Once again, I thank all you folks uh, who sent money to the church this week. We are being set up in the next day or two where you can just click and give it online and uh, there'll be a link or whatever to show you how to do that. But if you want to mail it, um, we had several this week. Uh, Offerings are very, very low as everywhere, everywhere. Church uh, people are laid off from work. So it's important that we all do our part if you can. Um, We're not one of those money grabbing, begging, money begging churches. Y'all know that. But I do believe that we should honor God with our tithes and offerings during any time, good times and bad times. So let's all stand, and I hope that you'll give this morning. P.O. Box 177, while they're all getting ready, if you want to mail it, P.O. Box 177, that's real easy to remember, 177, Nebo uh, 28761. That's P.O. Box 177, Nebo 28761. All right, Uh, let's pray. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for all that you've done for us. Thank you, Lord, for the good word of God that we've already heard this morning, for the Sunday school lesson, for the preaching and teaching and singing and fellowship, just getting to see uh, friends. I pray that you'd bless this offering this morning. I pray that you'd touch every person who gives. Those maybe don't have anything to give. I pray you'd bless them just the same, their heart. I pray that you'd bless this offering, multiply it, Uh, Send it in, Lord, to meet the need of the church, we pray. And we love you in Jesus' name. Amen. All right. Say about again. Luca's going to sing for you this morning, and I know it's going to be a blessing to you, and uh, you give him a listen here. Go ahead, brother. He's got, Oh, he's got something to say first. He's got something to say for you first. This is for all you kids at home, too. So uh, here's the, he's going to say the books of the Bible, and then sing. All right, brother? Are right, you ready? Go ahead. Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy, 
Joshua, Judges, Ruth, 1 Samuel, 2 Samuel, 1 Kings, 2 Kings, 1 Chronicles, 2 Chronicles, Ezra, Nehemiah, Esther, Job, Psalms, Proverbs, Ecclesiastes, Song of Solomon, Isaiah, Jeremiah, Lamentations, Ezekiel, Daniel, Hosea, Joel, Jonah, Micah, Amos, Obadiah, Jonah, Micah, Nahum, Habakkuk, Zephaniah, Haggai, Zechariah, Malachi, Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, Acts, Romans, 1 Corinthians, 2 Corinthians, Galatians, Ephesians, Philippians, Colossians, 1 Thessalonians, 2 Thessalonians, 1 Timothy, 2 Timothy, Titus, Philemon, Hebrews, James, 1 Peter, 2 Peter, 1 John, 2 John, 3 John, Jude, Revelation. some Jesus saved me the very moment he forgave me. He took away my heavy burdens. Lord, you gave me peace within. Satan won't make me doubt it. It's real and I'm going to shout it. I was there when it happened, so I guess I ought to know. Salvation is not real. I don't Does the world may argue that we cannot feel the heavy burdens lifted and the all sins go? That's good. That ought to be your testimony, and I hope it is. I was there when it happened. Way down, y'all. Um, so I guess I ought to know. Uh, yeah, that's a hard to argue with when somebody tells you what God done for them when he saved them. I was there when it happened. I know what the Lord did for me that night. Um, while you're getting your Bibles ready, all you folks at home, you're getting your Bibles out uh, and ready to turn to Scripture here this evening, or the morning, in the book of Acts, uh, we'll talk about this. Uh, something's completely different, so don't miss the service this evening. Six o'clock sharp p.m. We got some special singing planned, and we're going to be having special singing every service, and try to make it just as much like if you were here, so so that you can be blessed and enjoy it. I'd like to encourage you: don't get backslid during this time. Uh, this is a it'd be a the devil will knock a lot of people out through this. There'll be a lot of people never come back to church. When this is over with. That's so sad. Don't let it happen. Dig your feet in. Stay with God. Stay with what's right. Stay with what we've always known has always been right. And, and uh, the Lord never changes. Um, next Sunday, we have so many people that are calling, texting, asking about our Easter service. Everybody ought to be able to come to church on Easter. So we're going to have a parking lot service back here next Sunday. Please be here on time. Um, 
we're going to have parking attendants to, to direct the cars where to park. So you'll want to park where the guys tell you to next Sunday. So we line all the cars up back here in perfect lines. We'll have the piano. We'll have the uh, musicians. Uh, I'll be preaching out here. We're going to be on a flatbed truck, Lord willing, or on top of a bus. So uh, uh, don't miss next Sunday morning, Easter Sunday, and we'll have our parking lot service. Uh, it would be great if something changed by then. We could all get back together. But um, uh, as as I said, y'all, this this thing that's going on is uh, something rotten somewhere. Turning your Bible to Acts chapter fifteen. Um, I said a while ago something don't add up, and there's more going on than just a a, a, a disease or a virus or whatever. Way more. Uh, there, the, there are sinister plots taking place in this world to push us toward a one world government, a global government, control the masses, and eventually a one world dictator and a one world monetary system and do away with cash, as I preached last week. Uh, this morning, I'm going to preach about what to do during that time. You say, well, Brother Danny, what do you mean things don't add up? The, it don't, the, my, I, think, I think what we're hearing on the news so much is sort of like common core math. It, it don't, it don't something, something don't add up. Like that fella told a guy, he said, uh, 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 told this guy, he said, 67% of the people can't understand math. And the other two thirds don't even care. Like that. Uh, you heard that guy said, uh, uh, one guy said, he told his buddy, he said, if I gave you a rabbit today and I gave you another rabbit tomorrow and then I gave you another rabbit the next day and then I gave you another rabbit the next day, how many rabbits would you have? And the guy said, 27. He said, you don't understand much about math. And the guy said, you don't understand much about rabbits. So that's that's the way I feel about this thing. Some may some may adding up somewhere, y'all. Hey, they, uh, there's some stuff. I'm I'm not a, a conspiracy theorist necessarily, but if you think there's no conspiracy, you're you're not a Bible believer. The Bible, it's full of it. Over twenty something times conspiracies in the Bible, and there are definitely evil forces taking advantage of this situation and seizing upon it to advance. Their evil beliefs. Now's our chance. In other words, now's our chance. Let's do it. So uh, that's where we're headed. Now, me and you, there ain't no telling what we're liable to see before this is over. I'm hoping and praying like you are uh, that things work out. If it don't, we may be in for the worst time that we've ever seen in our life. I hope not. I pray not. But we may be. I've stood here a hundred times in this pulpit and said, folks, enjoy the Lord while you can. The day may come when we can't. I said, run them buses while we can. The day may come when we can't. That day's here. And it may get worse before it's over with. So I'm going to tell you about some men in the Bible who stayed on with God no matter what, all the way to the end. And uh, when I got saved when I was 18, I started preaching when I was 19, I did not get in this thing to quit. I didn't sign up to quit. I signed up to see it all the way through. By the grace of God, y'all, we go all the way through. Amen. Can I hear an amen at home? By the grace of God, we'll go all the way through, no matter what. No matter what. By God's grace, not by our own strength. I want to read you about some men that did just that. Acts chapter 15. Look at verse number 23. Acts chapter 15 and verse number 23. And they wrote letters by them after this manner. The apostles and elders and brethren send greeting unto the brethren which are of the Gentiles in Antioch and Syria and Cilicia. For as much as we have heard that certain which went out from us have troubled you with words subverting your souls, saying, you must be circumcised and keep the law, to whom we gave no such commandment. It seemed good unto us, being assembled with one accord, to send chosen men 
unto you with our beloved Barnabas and Paul. Look what he says about Barnabas and Paul and these other men. Men that have hazarded their lives for the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. That's the only time that word hazard is in the Bible. These men hazarded their lives for the Lord Jesus Christ. That's the title of my sermon this morning. They hazarded their lives. The only time it's mentioned in the Bible. If you want to know what that means, take, look over in chapter 14, verse uh, 19, where it said they stoned Paul. They beat him with rocks and left him uh, for dead. That's what hazarding your life means. The word hazard means to put at a risk of being lost. That means you're willing to risk your whole life for the Lord Jesus Christ. I got to thinking about this uh, this week, and the scripture came to my mind. I'd heard all the stories that we're seeing and hearing uh, from the uh, from the news reports and uh, and and clips and stuff people send around about the doctors and, and nurses and workers in our big hospitals in big cities and small cities around the country and around the world. They say that working in a major hospital this week was like we were in a time of war. They said you can't describe the scenes that, that were going on. Uh, they, the doctors and nurses and workers are like going into battle, literally, uh, every day. With, with bodies stacked in, in, the, in truck uh, uh, um, trailers outside, refrigerated body where they couldn't even get the body. You, there's many people that see their loved ones go in a hospital and never see them again. Not with them when they die. Not with them when, when they're, when they're uh, buried or exposed of or cremated or whatever they're doing with them. And, and never see them again on this earth. This virus that has come and grip, grip our country has done what bin Laden could not do. That's what he tried to do. They thought that if they knocked those buildings down, it would cripple the United States. It just, it, it, uh, we hobbled for a few days, and that's about it. This has brought our country to a halt, to a standstill. And honestly, uh, my hat's off to, to doctors, to nurses, to People that go in there every day and in the midst of them and work with people all day long knowing that they are hazarding their lives. I admire them. I, I'm telling you, I do. I admire people. And you say, well, they're getting paid. But they, they are. And, and, uh, but uh, many of them, they, they took an oath when they became a doctor or a nurse to try to help people. And they're, they're faithfully trying to fulfill their oath I say, praise God, I'm, I'm, I, that's a blessing. That ought to be an example to us as Christians. And we as Christians could learn from that. Uh, we as Christians could take an, an example from that. Years ago, Christians uh, said, you know what? We're a soldier in the Lord's army, and no matter what we have to face, we'll go through it for the glory of God. This modern generation of Christians, we think we are to be carried to uh, heaven on flowery beds of ease while others fought through bloody uh, fights and sailed through bloody seas. And as the old song said, we think that we're just, uh, we're living in a generation of, of celebrity Christianity who thinks uh, all you got to do is uh, be saved and you'll never have a problem. You'll never have a burden. You'll never get sick. You'll never have a, that's not Bible Christianity. That's not what the apostles faced. That's not what they're on. Uh, we're, 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 we, won't even, we won't even witness if somebody's going to make fun of us. We won't even get out of track lest we be laughed at or something like that. Listen, people, it, it's about separate the men and the boys before this thing's over with. And I'm not talking about male gender. I'm talking about ladies and young ladies and young girls. There were plenty of martyrs down through the years that gave their life for the gospel and the Lord Jesus Christ. My, my, my. So that's what I'm going to be talking about uh, this morning by the help of the Lord. Now I want to say, first of all, this morning, the cost is great. The cost is great. There's a tremendous cost 
you pay when you give up. The Lord said, if a man come to me and he's got, he's got to be willing to take up his cross, deny himself and follow me. I read the story of, of a man by the name of Sadhu Sundar Singh. He's an Indian, from India, from India, the country of India. His family was high caste in, in India. That means uh, uh, very high in the religion of uh, educated, which most of the people are not. They had education. They were wealthy. He come from a very high religious, well-to-do family in India. This was many, many years ago. He went to a Christian school for a while, and his dad talked to him, and he said, if you don't quit that, you're going to become a Christian. He said, no, Father, I would never deny our family. I would never deny our faith. I would never deny, I will not be a Christian. And burned a Bible for his daddy just to prove to him that he would never be Christian. Well, he kept hanging around at the gospel, and the Lord got a hold of his heart. And the Lord did get a hold of him. He did get saved by the grace of God. When he came in and told his parents that he got saved, his parents immediately said, you're out. You're done. We disown you. We never want to see you again. We never want to have anything to do with you again. You leave. That young lad of a boy left his home that night in India. It was, it was in the wet season, pouring the rain, cold as ice outside, and he spent that first night or two under a tree soaking wet with a few clothes that he had on his body and freezing in the cold rain. And uh, he, he, he said that he was so happy. He said, the joy that flooded my soul, knowing that I knew Jesus and that I belonged to him, that I was going to heaven. He said, it overcame all the hardships that I knew. He became a famous hard preaching evangelist. He became known as the apostle to India. He, he went and uh, to Tibet and was arrested. When he was in Tibet, they arrested him for preaching. They put him in a pit. They branded his body with hot irons. He finally got out. Are you listening to me? Are you listening? They branded his body with hot irons for preaching the gospel. And when he got out, he went to England. And he told them, he said, I'm going back. I'm going back to India and preach. And they said, you can't do it. He said, you, you can't do it. He said, uh, uh, you, you, they'll kill you. You'll never come out of there alive. And here's what he said. Listen to me. He looked at them men and he said, I am well aware of the cost. He said, I signed up for the Lord. My mind's made up. I'm going back to India. And he went back, and it wasn't long until he disappeared, and nobody ever heard from him again. No doubt was a martyr for the Lord Jesus Christ. You say, preacher, I just don't think I could do that. Well, not, not many people could. By the, by the help of the Lord, I hope we all could if it comes to that. And it might. And it will eventually for a lot of our brothers and sisters and is in other parts of the world. You see, here in America, we don't know what hard times are, people. We never had tough times in this country, most of us. Uh, we don't know what it's like to do without. I talked with one, one of our men, uh, good men at our church yesterday. We went visiting yesterday and we'd go, uh, we didn't, we didn't go in houses. Uh, we didn't, we didn't shake hands. We stayed six feet apart and sat out on the porch and talked to people. I wish every one of y'all would, would do, oh my goodness. Oh my goodness. You wouldn't believe how, how precious people are out there just wanting somebody to see them that hadn't saw a person in person in days and days. We sat on the front porch up here and talked to a man. He's watching right now. Brother Pinky, I'm sure you're watching right now. Uh, I, and he told me uh, he'll be 90 years old here in a few days. And he said, uh, he said, I lived through part of the Great Depression. He said, I lived through part of that. Born 1930, the Great Depression hit in 1929. And for years, it was like 10 years there, things were really, really bad in this country, in America. He said, we lived off uh, cornbread and buttermilk. Every night, supper, cornbread and buttermilk. Supper, cornbread. You see, we don't know what hard times are. We think we're all, we're suffering because 
football game or you know baseball. We think, oh, how awful. We can't even go eat lobster. But listen, he said we had cornbread and 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 buttermilk, and he said that's what we lived off of. And uh, hell, I mean, this man comes to our church every Sunday when before all this happened. And he said uh, he said one day, mom, we went to the store or something like that. He said, mom, we're gonna splurge. Got a can of sardines. He said, we're getting a can of sardines. It cost 10 cents. And he said, boy, we thought, well, that's like steak. And I'm telling you something, people, we don't know what hard times is. We may be fixing to find out. I hope not. I'm not trying to be a prophet of gloom. The future is bright for the children of God. We're going to a place where there ain't going to be no virus. We're going to a place where there ain't going to be no sickness. But between here and there, we may suffer a lot of things down here in this world. But the cost is great. The cost is great. I read about the famous uh, missionary James Calvert who went to the cannibals in Fiji. Listen to this. And the the people were cannibals in the Fiji island. And the captain of the ship said, you've lost your mind. He said, you can't do this. You could get sick. You could die. Don't do this. He said, do you realize you could die? And James Calvert looked at him and he said this. He said, we died before we came. We died before we came. And that's what a Christian is. A Christian is somebody like Paul who said, ye are dead and your life is hid with Christ in God. They can't kill us. We're already dead. We died when we got saved. We're our life. If we be, we, we are, uh, for now is our life hid in Christ. You're crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live, yet not I, but the, but the, the God liveth, the Lord Jesus liveth in me. He was in me. We're dead and yet still live. He said we died before we got here. Ladies and gentlemen, the cost is great. But I will say secondly this morning, secondly, the need is great. The need is great. I'm telling you, the need is great. People are lost. People are dying. I mean, uh, uh, they're they're bringing these nurses and and they're advertising, please come and help. Please come and help. If you have any nursing experience, if you're even retired, doctors are, are coming to help because there's people sick and dying all over the country and there are people dying everywhere and they're saying the need is we need you, we need you. I want to say we are in the same situation in the, in the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. People are dying. People uh, people are dying without ever seeing their family and friends. I heard them on the one of the newscasts. I've been I keep up with just enough of the news to keep up with the major stories and then turn it off. Uh, stay in your Bible, stay with the Lord. You'll 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 drive yourself crazy. They, there's been people commit suicide just this week. Even some nurses committed suicide uh, because they say there's hopeless. There's no way out. So keep your eyes off the news and in the Word and on the Lord, and you can get through this a whole lot better. You'll find out something major happens and did you know they say they say that uh, on the news they said uh, well, a lot of these people are dying and they get to call and talk to a monk I don't know how they're going to do them no good uh, or talk to a priest you know they need somebody to point them to the Lord they need somebody to point them to the Lord they need somebody to point them to the Lord do you know this somebody said this week uh, is, on a, is on a news report that because of this 40% of Americans are now worried about their mental health, 40%. That's almost half the people in America are saying, I'm about to go crazy. I, I, and listen, we got more weeks of this stuff. You, you better have something that keeps you straight. You better have something to keep you so. And I'll be honest with you. If I didn't know the Lord and I didn't have the Bible and I didn't understand about Scripture, if I didn't understand about plagues and pestilences, and if I didn't understand about the future, and if I didn't see the, if I didn't know the future about where this is headed and that the Lord's coming and that we're going to rise to meet Him with a shout and see the Lord and it's all going to turn out right. I'd be depressed too. I'd think, Lord, how many psychiatrists are going to get rich off of this? Uh, They're going to be counseling. The world's looking for answers. But I'm telling you, wherever you hear this, wherever you hear this message, all parts of the world, the answer is not in a psychiatric couch. The answer is not in a liquor bottle. Liquor sales are up. They're talking about alcohol. People just saying, I'm going to get drunk. Wake me when it's over. That is not the answer. The Lord 
Jesus Christ is the answer. He's the answer, y'all. He's the answer. He always has been. He always has been. What a time for the church to rise up and say, yes, we have the answer. Not a time for some nut to rise up like the video he sent me about some healer preacher rebuking the COVID-19. He rebuked it a week ago and told it to leave, and it's still here. Uh, so he, he, did, he wasn't right. Uh, listen, buddy, it's here. It's here. It's here. You know what? The answer ain't over here. The answer ain't over here. The answer ain't back there. The answer's up there. The answer that way. It's not to the right or the left. It's up that way. Listen, the Lord's able to make this thing leave. He's able to make it go away. He's able to fix it all. I mean, ain't no doubt about his power. But if he don't, whether we're to go on anyway and serve him and do right and serve God, the God that's brought us through all this time is the God that'll take us through the rest of the way. Make sure your family's saved. Make sure your neighbors are saved. Talk to your kids. You parents at home, this is a good time for you to set them kids down one at a time and say, listen, don't be embarrassed. Your own kids say, listen, do you need me to pray with you, honey? Uh, you may, Make sure you're a Christian. Make sure you put your faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. The need is great. Uh, all over the world, I, I was thinking uh, this, this, this week, all over the world, people are praying to false gods and Hinduism, and Islam, and all those other countries. I mean, it's, it's all over the world. And they're praying, uh, oh, oh, God, oh, whatever their God is, please take this virus away. Please tell our people, you tell me the need ain't great. You tell me people don't need the Lord. You tell me people don't need the Lord. See, me and you, we, we got it. We got the answer. We, we know the future. We know if, if this virus goes away and things smooth out for a few more years, something else is going to happen. And then something else is going to happen. It ain't never going to be right down here. This sin has ruined this mess. It ain't never going to be right till God fixes it and makes it right. And so uh, the need is great. Your neighbors need the Lord. Your, your kin folks need the Lord. Good time to call your kin folks. Good time to leave some tracks. You say, Brother Danny, I'm scared to go out of the house. Uh, well, some you got a phone. Uh, you got, I mean, uh, and if you get out, tell, give somebody a track. I, I ain't had nobody get, uh, 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 refuse a track or even a witness. Boy and girl sitting on the side of the road. Me and Ethan's out visiting yesterday up yonder, and I just swerved over like this and say, "Here, y'all. This will tell you about Jesus. He's the answer." Boy took it just like that. There's a need. There's a need. People are hungry. People are hungry for the gospel. The need is great. Hazard our lives, if need be, for the Lord Jesus Christ. Number three. Not only is the cost great, not only the need is great, but thirdly, the task is great. You think about it. You think about uh, the uh, never, never have we seen such a thing in this country. People say, well, the, the Spanish flu, uh, more people died, bubonic plague, more people died. I understand that. But uh, we've never seen a time in modern history when the whole country shut down like this. And there's going to come that tipping point where the economy, you, you can't pay people to stay home and not go to work but so long. And eventually it's going to swallow. Uh, I'm not saying that's a bad idea. I, mean, I guess we did what we had to do. And I, I respect the advice of medical leaders and authority and stuff like that to a point. But you got to wonder if there's not people pulling strings somewhere that want the country to shut down completely, not just because of the virus, but so that the entire population, what's left of it, will have to depend on the government to take care of them. That's a dangerous direction to go in. And I won't, I won't take time to go into all of that this, this morning, but the task that you and I have is great. I'll tell you the story again of missionary John Patton. If you don't know that's the story of John Patton, you got some time, you can look him up on YouTube. There's tons of videos telling the story, the life story of John Patton who left for the mission field November the 5th, 1850, for the New Herbides Island. And the New Herbides Islands, there was, like, there was like 30 of these islands. And there were savages, heathen, lived on these islands. Actually, there's a whole bunch more of them, but they, the New Herbides Islands uh, were, were basically 25, about 30 of these islands. 
two men had went there as missionaries, and immediately, as soon as those two men had got off the boat, within a day, they were clubbed to death, and they were murdered and eaten by the cannibals on those islands. You say, boy, what a waste. Oh, no, I ain't through preaching yet. Those men left their home, went to that island where they knew they were in danger and didn't last long at all. They were beat to death and eaten alive or, or dead, but I, I killed them and then, and then ate them. John Patton went there. His wife got sick and died shortly thereafter. Baby she had had, 36 days old, died after his mama did. 36 days old. John Patton never gave up. He kept preaching. He kept, he raised money to build a steamship to take the gospel to those islands. And ladies and gentlemen, it, it was, it, he, he had tremendous opposition. Tremendous. Everything that could go wrong went wrong. But he kept going and kept going. Stories of men like this, we stand on their shoulders. We follow their pattern. Men that have hazarded their lives for the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. And John Patton went back. And he got married the, uh, the second time. And him and his wife went to those islands again and preached. And they told him just like they told the other fellows. They said, they'll kill you. They'll kill you. Charles Spurgeon even mentioned him and said he was the king of, uh, of the uh, king of the cannibals. John Patton had such an influence on those islands that they said Charles Darwin, Charles Darwin, who invented the theory of evolution, the religion called evolution, who started it. Charles Darwin knew of the missionary work of John Patton, and he said this. He said, "I don't believe in God." But he said, if I did, I'd believe it because of the work John Patton done on the New Hebrides Islands. And when he died, here's what they said. They said when he came, there were all cannibals and no Christians. They said when he died, there were all Christians and no cannibals. And 25 out of 30 islands had a mission station on those islands. Hey, hey, that man went there and said, hey, they may kill me tomorrow, but by the grace of God, I'll go and do what God's called me to do. And he left his mark on this world. Brother, that man fits our text today. He hazarded his life, and he finally lost it. Lord have mercy. He found out the task was great and got the job done. Number four, I'll tell you this and I'm through. I said the cost is great. Secondly, the need is great. Thirdly, the task is great. Fourthly, the reward's great. The reward's great. You listening? The reward's great. You say, Brother Danny, those men that went down there and went down there and, and uh, uh, lost their lives a couple of days after or day, the day they got there, you mean tell me that was worth it? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. And I thought about this this week. You know, they're saying, like in New York City, they are paying. I heard uh, the nurses $103 an hour taking care of all their, all their, and people said, boy, I like, listen, they're risking their life. They're risking their life. So the, the hospitals are saying, and I'm not sure that's right. That's what I've been told by nurses. And they said, uh, they'll pay for your plane ticket, pay your trip up there and back if you're coming up. You know why? You know why they get paid so much? Because, because the risk they're taking, because of the cost they're paying, because they're taking a chance of losing their own life. They say, you're willing to do this like the army and stuff. They'll, they'll pay you well. Listen, you get paid well for this kind of life. And you know, I got to thinking about that, and I thought, glory to God, hallelujah. If, the, if, the, if they're going in there risking their lives, and the, and the hospitals are saying, we're going to pay you an amazing amount of money, this huge amount of money, because you're willing to risk your life. And I got to thinking about what the Lord said. The Lord said, if you give a cup of cold water in my name, you'll not lose your reward. The Lord said, give and it shall be given unto you. Listen, but they, there ain't no 
telling what the Lord's got up there for these guys I've been telling you about this morning. Good night. Can you imagine? You know, everybody down here, they said, boy, I want a nice house. Or not. Nothing wrong with it. If you got it, hope you all get one. Uh, but Lord, you think about what God's going to give people who risked their lives, who hazarded their lives, who lost their lives. Are you kidding me? Are you kidding me? The Lord pays well, people. The Lord pays well. He's a good employer to his employees. I've told you before about the famous uh, preacher David Livingston, who was a missionary to Africa. And David Livingston, uh, another man who hazarded his life for the Lord Jesus Christ. He's a medical student, studying to be a medical doctor. And he decided... Uh, he, he sat around one day and it hit him like, like it did other people. And I hope it does you eventually. He sat in one day and he said, I've only got one life. I'm going to make the most out of it. That's what he said. And he said, where can I go to serve the Lord? And he got a map out. And he started looking at the different countries on the map. And he said, uh, China. He said, there's a great need. There's more people there. I'll go to China and I'll serve the Lord as a medical missionary. And then, lo and behold, he heard the famous preacher, her, uh, Robert Moffat of Africa. And he is, Robert Moffat was a missionary to Africa. You need to look these guys up and study them while you got the time. And he said, uh, he heard Robert Moffat preach. And Robert Moffat said this. He said, when I live in Africa, he said, from the hill I live on. I can see the smoke of a thousand villages and they're lost. And he said, when he heard that, he changed his mind. And he said, there's never been a missionary. There's never heard the gospel. They've never, they've never heard the word of God. David Livingston said, I'll go. And left his wife and children in uh Glasgow, I think, that's where they stayed, went to the mission field in Africa. You've heard me tell it before, how that one, at one time a lion, a raging African lion, come out and, and tore off his arm, nearly tore his arm off before he could get away. He had to learn how to shoot his gun uh, this way because he couldn't do his arm, move his arm like that. His life was threatened. He suffered fever, got sick. Separation from his family. He could have just said, forget it. I'm going to go back home and live my life easy. Line, a line almost killed me. But he stayed there. Wound up dying in a hut down there in the wilderness. They said they cut his heart out of his body and buried it in Africa. And took his body back to England. You can visit his grave marker to this very day. David Livingston said, the Lord gave his life for me. I'm willing to go to the ends of the earth and if necessary, give my life for him. And that's exactly what he did. You don't think, brother, the band played when he walked in glory. You don't think the Lord said, all right, everybody stop just a second. And brother, they all stood and sang, all hail the power of Jesus' name. Let angels prostrate fall. Bring forth the royal diadem, crown him Lord of all. And David Livingston, some of you, buddy, they had a hallelujah time. He's up there in heaven this morning waiting on the rest of us. He's up there shouting the victory. I'm going to read you some scripture that you well should well know in Hebrews chapter number 11, and I'm through. Here's what they did back in the Old Testament. By faith the harlot Rahab perished not with them that believed not when she received the spies with peace. Uh, and he said, um, and what shall I say? More. Time would fail me to tell of Gideon, of Barak, of Samson, not that Barak, and Jephthah, and David also, and Samuel, and the prophets, who through faith subdued kingdoms, wrought righteousness, obtained promises, stopped the mouths of lions, quenched the violence of fire, escaped the edge of the sores, out of weakness um, were made strong, waxed valiant in fight, turned to flight the armies of the aliens, women with their uh, received their dead, raised to life again, and others were tortured, 
not accepting deliverance that they might obtain a better resurrection. But that's shouting ground. Them people said, no, no, no. I ain't going to take a life of ease. I'll go ahead and give my life for God. I'll shout about it on the other side over there. The reward's great. The reward's great. Can I tell you all something this morning in closing? You're never wasting your life giving it all. For the Lord. Brother Derek mentioned it in Sunday school. Maybe the Lord's wanting to speak to us as Christian people in this country. Maybe it's time for us Christians to quit playing games. Maybe it's time for us Christians to quit fooling around, half in, half out, one foot in the world, the other and in the church, and get our life right while we still can. God help us. I ain't trying to sound no big shot, no kind of hero, no like that. I'm a I'm a big chicken. But but there's something wrong. With this sissified generation of preachers that that thinks you're supposed to ride around in nice cars and eat steak every night and preach and everybody take up a big love offering and you live in and stay in a nice motel. So that ain't Bible Christianity. Nothing wrong with that preacher being treated nice. Nothing wrong. And 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 you should be good to God's men. Nothing wrong. I'm just saying. You don't expect that. That ain't what Paul had. That ain't what our forefathers had. That ain't what the missionaries had. We ain't no better than they are. We may wind up digging ditches and sleeping outside. Who knows? But I'll tell you one thing. By the grace of God, whatever you suffer for the Lord, you'll be well repaid when the Lord comes and takes you home. Let's bow our head, please. Everybody at home here, bow your head. We're going to pray. I want to ask you while your heads are bowed and eyes are closed, where do you stand with the Lord this morning, my friend? Where do you stand? Is everything right? Maybe you're hearing this message and you say, Brother Danny, I don't understand why the Lord allowed the coronavirus to come or why he sent it. I don't understand that. Well, uh, nobody does, I don't guess. But I'll tell you one thing. I'm telling you one thing. God knows and he don't make no mistakes. And if he's using this to get you right with him, it can be the biggest blessing that's ever happened to you. Why don't you ask him? to be your Savior right now. Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. Trust Him right now. Right now, while your heads are bowed and eyes are closed, why don't you just say, dear Lord, I know I'm a sinner. Lord, I'm sorry for my sin. And I believe that you died for my sin on the cross many, many hundreds of years ago. Lord, right now, the best way I know how, I trust you and you only for my salvation my only hope for heaven. I believe you died for me. Right now, I trust what you did on the cross to save my soul. Thank you, Jesus. Help me to live for you and serve you all the days of my life in gratitude for what you've done for me. I pray, Lord, that you'd help every one of these people listening at home or on the road or in jail or hospital or in in places of confinement. I pray that you'd speak to every single heart. May your will be done in our lives. Take this message and use it to reach thousands of people throughout the world. We'll thank you and praise you for it in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. All right. All right. God bless you. We're going to. We're going to remind you, we'll be back here at 6 o'clock this evening. Tell your friends, text everybody, tell them to tune in. We've got something really good for you to help you with your kids, all y'all that are cooped up at home with your kids. Uh, That'll be for tonight at 6 o'clock. Make sure the kids are listening. Make sure mom and daddy's listening at 6. We've got special singing too. And don't forget, next Sunday morning, uh, we'll have, we will have Sunday school at 10, but our big Easter service will be at 11 o'clock in the parking lot. This is, of course, weather permitting. Uh, weather permitting. Uh, if it's 80, 90% chance of rain, obviously uh, we won't do it. But if it's a uh, small chance of rain and we can do it, we're going to have service out here in the parking lot next Sunday morning. Make sure you're here on time and be willing to follow the guy's direction. They're going to tell you where to park uh, so we'll, we can line up and get everybody back there. Okay? God bless you. All right. Let's stand here. All of you that are here, we'll be dismissed with prayer. Uh, I'm going to ask Brother Terry if he'll dismiss us. Y'all be friendly in the Lord before you leave. Be back here at 6 o'clock this evening. Go ahead, brother. God bless you.